Welcome to Inner Compass. I'm Karen Salpi. Someone stepping up onto a stage trips and falls. Half the audience laughs, half the audience doesn't, and they're mad at the first half for laughing. Why is that? Why do different people respond so differently to physical humor, to puns, or to jokes? Today we're going to learn what happens to our brains and our relationships when we share our Join us on Inner Compass. My guest today is Paul Mose of the Calvin College Psychology Department, who studies the relationship between the left and right hemispheres of the brain and how humor affects them both. Welcome, Paul. Thank you, Karen. I love to be around people who make me laugh, but you and I both know plenty of people and organizations that exhibit no sense of humor. Is that okay, or is humor essential to human well-being? Well, I think it's certainly okay, and there were, in, in history, there have been people who thought humor was uh, very, not only unimportant, but really something you shouldn't even get involved in. Puritans were particularly humorless, um, and Calvinists had that sort of reputation of being humorless. Mm -hmm. They worried that somebody somewhere might be having a good time. And that would be dangerous. That would be dangerous. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't think it's certainly essential, and there are people who aren't very uh, humorous, um, and they do very well. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that it's essential for well-being, but it is important. It's fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what happens in our brains and our bodies when we hear something funny? First of all, what makes something funny is when there's an incongruity. So, uh, for example, um, this is a joke I use in some of my research. Uh, I'm missing my ex-wife, but I'm improving my aim. And so the, the uh, ending there, uh, has completely different meanings. So you, have, you expect one ending, you expect a certain mm -hmm. connotation, and then the ending is completely different. Plus it violates a norm. And one of the things we know about language is that the right frontal lobe is particularly good in this incongruity. You, you so, mean in terms of understanding the right. processing? So the left hemisphere is very logical and uh, rote. So it has an expectation. When it doesn't receive the expectation, it's sort of befuddled. Mm -hmm. Whereas the right hemisphere is very good at keeping uh, other interpretations available for a period of time. So the right hemisphere is more flexible. Right, right. So the interpretation of that joke uh, is requi requires the right hemisphere to, uh, to make the incongruity congruous again. But then when, when you finally catch the, the double meaning, that's when it, we find it funny. So the resolution happens probably in both hemispheres, but it's the finding of the meaning that happens in the right. So it's like solving a little puzzle. Mm -hmm. I've always thought, I mean, as I think about humor, I do think that it's what, at least what makes me laugh is always a surprise, mm -hmm. right? I guess I feel like the surprise sort of energizes me in a way. That's right, and that's one of the things that's still a little puzzling. Why do we enjoy the surprise so much? Yeah. What is there that wordplay that's so beneficial? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's because we enjoy the, the surprise. We enjoy any surprise. Mm -hmm. So we've also done some examination of uh, humor across the lifespan. And of course, little tiny babies already, when they're seven months, they love peekaboo, right. and that's a surprise. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's an incongruity there as well. It's sort of a physical incongruity. You were there, and, and then you're gone, and then you're back again. I like the feeling of accomplishment of solving the puzzle. Is that mm -hmm. what's happening for a little baby too? When your when your face comes back, they realize, right, it's okay, or you were there all along. Or? Right, humor serves a lot of purposes, and one of the things it does is it signals that things are okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so when somebody falls on the ice. Um, the first thing you do is check to see if they're all right, and then as and then soon as they laugh. get up, then you laugh. Mm -hmm. um, and they laugh, hopefully, uh, to signal it's okay. And so humor, one of the purposes of it is to signal that there's no danger, um, there's no harm. And so we kind of, we are particularly delighted in things that press the edge of danger mm -hmm. or the edge of inappropriateness. Um, and then we find that even more delightful, like it's okay. So that's a little like a roller coaster ride. Mm -hmm. Other than surprise or incongruity, are there particular elements that are necessary for something to be funny? It, again, incongruity with uh, standards. Um, so if it presses a moral or social standard, um, that's why sexual jokes are oftentimes used. Uh, and that's why there's a lot of inappropriate humor too, racist, sexist, um, because they violate norms. Uh, and so depending on your background or, or what you feel are established norms, 
those may or may not, you might find those funny or not. So that's sort of like just pressing the, the edges of danger, like watching the other person fall down. Right, okay, right. Okay, that makes sense, that makes sense. Um, some people seem born with a sense of humor. I had a, my, my youngest cousin, I think, sort of had a sense of irony from about the age of two on, and other people never seem to acquire or cultivate, at least not my sense of humor. Is it, how much do you think it's learned and how much is it just something you get or you don't? Well, I'm sure learning plays a role. I grew up in a family that we loved to tell jokes. I had uncles who would come over, and uh, it was a family activity to just tell stories and jokes. And so uh, I think it's both genetic and learned. Um, but there's a lot of evidence that there are strong personality traits that start early on. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, a researcher, Hans Essink, um, did a lot of research on personality and uh, pretty much confirmed that it starts early on. But there's all kinds of different uh, types of type of humor right. or sense of humor. Yeah. So um, he identified about four types. So when you say somebody has a good sense of humor, that could mean four different things it, potentially. When I say it, it probably means they have my sense of humor. Right? <laughs> right. I mean, why, why is it that, that uh, it, it seems like guys all like the Three Stooges. Uh, I just don't. And a lot of women I know don't mm -hmm. see that as funny. What, what's going on there? Uh, I taught a class actually on humor and we did a little study of our students and their one uh, questionnaire we gave them is a questionnaire on types of humor that they like. And one type is a more aggressive humor and males certainly score higher on, than females on more aggressive humor, physical or even socially aggressive humor. Um, females do like some socially aggressive humor, you know, somebody, um, one female calling down another female, but otherwise they pretty much stay away and they prefer affiliative humor. Uh, humor that uh, builds relationships mm -hmm. or involves relationships. Um, so they prefer word humor uh, and uh, humor about relationships. Why? Uh, well, they <laughs> tend to be more relational creatures, I think. Um, they, it's hard to identify exactly why that is. I don't know if that's uh, a acculturated difference uh, or if that's something that's inborn. Uh, that's a good question. It is, I mean, I guess we're just on the on the edge of maybe beginning to understand, you know, why why boys tend to gravitate toward more aggressive toys and more aggressive play, and, mm -hmm. and there seem more and more evidence that that's true no matter what you do culturally, right? I, Pretty sure it's a little bit of both, mm -hmm. where there are some inborn differences, but culture tends to accentuate those. Uh, we don't like overlap very much, and so we tend to enhance the differences that exist. You want to categorize. Yeah, and it's uh, probably apply to humor as well. Is there a difference between men and women's brains and how they're processing all that? That's a good question. I'm actually, that's something I'm exploring right now. Um, there is a difference in how women uh, handle uh, verbal processing in the left and right hemispheres. There's some evidence that men, uh, women handle a lot of language in both hemispheres, whereas men primarily in the left. So one of the things that's been unexplored is whether or not females process this what we call non-literal language, so double meanings isn't literal, um, whether they utilize the right hemisphere even more. Do animals have sense of humor? Uh, we know that um, chimps laugh, for example, there's a number of apes and uh, primates that um, will laugh. One of the things that chimps do that's really interesting, when they laugh, they, they laugh on the exhale and the inhale. Mm -hmm. We only laugh on the exhale. Mm -hmm. So they actually can laugh twice as much. So when they find something funny, it's really it's funny really for funny. them. Um, they laugh when they play, and they laugh, they can be tickled. Um, it's really funny to see a, a chimp laugh when it's tickled. Even fake laughter apparently has some physical benefit to us, right? Mm -hmm. Like apart from humor, what, is la what does laughter do for us? Uh, well, there's been a lot of studies on it and they're actually pretty mixed, um, not showing as positive results as a lot of people thought. Uh, Norman Cousins was a big promoter of um, humor as a way to promote health. Mm -hmm. He believed that he pretty much laughed himself out of cancer. Um, I've read about people like uh, arguing that and yeah, yeah and, and that's probably a bit overstated but it does have physical benefits so uh, respirations improve your heart rate improves uh, it's a good stress reducer mm -hmm. um, so we know that it actually does alleviate stress 
I guess, yeah, I'm thinking of sort of angry or sarcastic laughter. Even, even that seems to relieve something in, in us, right? Right, although a lot of aggressive humor can be the opposite. It yeah. can actually do damage. In fact, they did a study of people who use a lot of aggressive and sarcastic humor, and they actually had poorer health outcomes. Really? So because they're carrying that anger. They're carrying a lot of anger, and, and, and they're using humor in aggressive ways rather than sort of building ways. Did different cultures value humor differently? You, I mean, you mentioned the Puritans who really were very resistant to, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. uh, entertainment. Yeah, uh, yeah. I've done a lot of studies on cross-cultural humor. Uh, I haven't, but other people have. And uh, they find that, for one thing, it's a universal phenomenon. I mean, just like you can see it in animals, you see it across cultures. And some things are universally funny. Uh, like Pratt what? Falls, yeah. uh, uh, things, things bump into a tree or something like that. Those are almost always universally funny. Uh, surprises, and so young children laugh at the same things across cultures. It doesn't matter who they are. Funny but, words. <laughs> funny words, yeah. uh, wordplay. But that incongruity issue varies a lot in terms of what people find incongruous. Um, a lot has to do with social norms. Uh, a lot has to do with um, the understanding of the words themselves. Uh, so it's been said, uh, we did some study of this in looking at scripture, and uh, some biblical, biblical scholars say there's actually quite a bit of humor in the Bible, but we don't catch it huh. because culturally it doesn't make any sense to us. Some so of that's linguistic, right? It's linguistic, but also cultural. So the people in the audience, when someone's speaking, when Jesus or somebody else is talking, would get the, the pun or the double meaning but we wouldn't. Can you give me an example? No. Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I tried to look for some, yeah. um, but um, so people were telling me this, but I, I really, we never did identify exactly what those were. As you mentioned, different people have different kinds of humor. Um, puns, w w why is the universal response to a pun always to groan? <laughs> <laughs> uh, boy, that's a tough one. I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Uh, I should know because I've used plenty of puns and, yeah, and got, one uh, of those. The, got the yeah. same reaction every time. Yeah. So it's, yeah. unless, it's, unless it's another punster, then they appreciate them more. Can you categorize like verbal and physical and maybe conceptual humor? Are there others? Well, there's some interesting studies of people with brain injury, um, people with right frontal lobe damage they will have difficulty with verbal humor. Sure. Um, they don't get the double meanings. Uh, they simply stare at you like, I, I don't really understand that at all. Mm -hmm. um, but they will get physical humor. So that sort of incongruity uh, seems to be different and processed in a different way. So those seem to be somewhat separatable kinds of skills, mental skills. Um, that is interesting. So, and, and so, for instance, if, if one is autistic, they might perceive humor differently or not at all. Right. Uh, one thing that's interesting about individuals with autism is that they actually are fairly good producers of humor, mm -hmm. um, but they're not very good receivers of it. Do, I mean, when you mm -hmm. say they're producers of humor, you mean intentionally they can mm -hmm. make jokes? They seem to understand that others find it funny. Okay. They themselves don't find it funny. Mm. Um, so they won't laugh at their own jokes. They won't laugh at other jokes. So, do, so when an autistic person tells a joke, is he or she simply repeating something they've heard or putting together the pieces in, in a way they've been trained to do? Uh, they enjoy wordplay oftentimes, huh. um, but enjoy is sort of a different kind of thing. Um, it seems like the emotional response, which is another component obviously of humor, is a little different. So they might understand the wordplay, but they don't really appreciate it in the same way. So they'll, they'll seem to enjoy it. They'll enjoy sparring with someone. Mm -hmm. um, these are high functioning uh, sure. people with autism, uh, but uh, they uh, will sometimes have uh, difficulty catching some nuances of wordplay. So then why tell jokes? Um, that's a good question. Uh, so there seems to be different levels of enjoyment. Mm -hmm. um, jokes themselves is hard to understand. Of course, jokes promote humor and I can explain better why we have humor. So I guess one follows from the other. And one of the things, um, first of all, it's a signal that things are okay. Mm -hmm. It's a signal that this is playtime versus aggression. So we enjoy humor because just like animals, chimps will signal, for example, if there's a dangerous threat. Um, but they'll also signal when it's okay. 
And so humor is in some respects a signal things are okay. But humor is also a real strong bonding uh, function. It has a very strong social function. And I think in terms of health benefits, that's probably its greatest benefit, is that it promotes healthy relationships. And so humor has probably its greatest social benefit in building relationships, in shared understanding, mm -hmm. in shared um, sort of meaning, um, so catching the meaning of other people, mm -hmm. um, and uh, just shared enjoyment. Is that why inside jokes become so important? Um, you know, a yeah. group that you've been part of will have something they laugh at that no one else ever does. Uh, my family, long ago at a funeral of a very elderly relative, it was a very sad occasion, mm -hmm. but the pallbearers came tottering down the aisle and, and one by one my mother and her sisters all just dissolved into giggles. And, and so now family funerals almost always involve giggling just at the memory of the memory. Sure. Got to be very inappropriate to any other group, but we understand why it's okay. That's right, because there's that shared experience. Yeah. And and you know, producers of uh, comedy TV shows have a laugh track because mm -hmm. it's contagious, and so laughter is best is when it's shared. Mm -hmm. um, we enjoy movies more if we're with other people, especially if it's a funny movie. Um, a joke is better if there's a lot of people. Um, so the, the shared experience is a big part of humor. And it seems to bond people together quite a bit. So in that bonding process using humor, often it seems that the humor involves demeaning people that are outside the group. Is that necessary? Uh, it, or it, I don't to know do that it? it's necessary. Yeah. Uh, it happens a lot. Um, yeah, that's a psychological phenomenon in general. We feel stronger with our group identity if we can Define make some distinction not. yeah, between us and somebody else. So I don't know if that's so much a process of humor is it a process of social groups uh, and and females do that if they're going to do, do aggressive humor they will tend to have a lot of in-group out-group um, kind of humor shared relationships together but also um, commenting on the out-group I'd like to deny that but I suspect <laughs> you're probably right well. um, sarcasm can be passive-aggressive you know I, I I thought you'd forgotten about me sort of things um, yeah. it, are there ways to respond to that sort of manipulative humor that, that can diffuse it? Yeah, that's a good one. I mean, um, sarcasm is, is very aggressive humor sometimes. And of course, the tough part of it is, do they really mean that or do they mean it by a little bit? Um, so it can be very damaging yeah. at times. It also can be very helpful, though, too, because it's a way to provide some critique of someone in a fairly safe way. Um, so rather than saying, I think you did something really stupid, we can make a humorous comment about it. So it's a little bit softer way to criticize. So there's a fine line between being helpful with a sarcasm or being very hurtful, uh, and, and so that's very difficult. There really is. I wanted to ask you about satire. When I teach literature, we talk about satire, uh, which, is, which is idealistic in its nature. The goal of satire really is to critique so that the, the offending body can correct itself. And there is gentle sat satire and there's really a angry, cruel satire. Um, but satire backfires so often, it's very dangerous. Yeah. Uh, is that because people don't perceive it as humorous? Is it, it, you know, is there a line that you have to not cross? Well, it's always funnier when it's somebody else. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah right. So if it's focused when on... When you're the one being criticized. Right, right. Uh, well, political satire, for example, can be really powerful um, it's been, been used for decades, of course, uh, centuries perhaps, uh, and it's a really valuable way to caricature um, political leaders and their ideas. ideas. So I think that's, that's actually a very important kind of use of humor. Do you think in, in our day and age that politicians hear themselves being criticized and step back and say, oh yes, that was, that was foolish what I did? Or, or do the s political satirists, satirists today simply reinforce the beliefs of the group? It, like, are they preaching to the choir? Well, I'm told that Al Gore, after the Saturday Night Live spoofs of his uh, presidential debates, actually studied them. Really? Yeah, to get ideas for what he shouldn't do in his okay. communication skills. So uh, I guess it could be useful. And so apparently they do take note of what people say about them or how they're portrayed. Uh,
and maybe hear it sometimes. And, and maybe hear it and use that, perhaps. I'm a big fan of Stephen Colbert because his humor to me is is never cruel. It's mm -hmm. often very ironic. It's mm -hmm. satirical, but, it, but it's never cruel. And I think if you teased me, Stephen Colbert, I think I would be able to laugh at myself. Right. Well, I think if, if humorists use a lot of self-deprecating humor, it's easier to take it if they also uh, are, use humor against others. Right. So I, I think that's, that's a way to soften it, because then you know it's, it's an equal opportunity uh, yeah. sarcasm. So yeah. uh, everyone is, is a target. You, you talked earlier about, for instance, racist jokes as sort of pushing the edge of danger. Um, are, are they also maybe um, dysfunctional coping mechanisms? Are people trying to, to sort out anger in some way? Well, I, you know, I, I think it really is and a form of aggression, I mean, and a form of stereotyping, so it reinforces uh, beliefs as well. Mm -hmm. it, so it violates norms, but it also reinforces them, mm -hmm. and sometimes inappropriate norms. So the class that we taught, we talked a little bit about that, about uh, inappropriate humor. What kind of humor is damaging? Mm -hmm. um, is it okay to tell jokes about blonde people or lawyers or other groups and stereotype them? Um, is that just uh, wordplay, or is that just um, trying to violate a norm and it's safe, or does it really do damage to people? Mm -hmm. And I don't, we didn't come to simple conclusions about that, but we realized that it had the potential. I think it really interesting to, to think about what, what my motives are when I tell a joke. I don't consider myself, I tell my students that I'm ironic but not sarcastic. And my students then inevitably within the next hour will point out two or three instances of my being sarcastic. <laughs> the difference is there that sarcasm is, is angry, Sar sarcasm attacks, and irony simply discovers and points out incongruities. Right. Do you find yourself thinking harder now that you've done this research about about the jokes you tell or about what you respond to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you, you stop and think about what does it do to the audience that I'm uh, giving the joke to? Um, and, and I've actually set slightly different standards for different people, not because I think it's always appropriate, because I know they'll take it in the, in the context, mm -hmm. that they'll understand it within that situation. And others I know might feel offended by it, so I, I'm careful who I tell it to. Um, because I know how they personally will react. So I think understanding your audience is an important part of it, and you're sort of building up people or tearing them down based on uh, the kind of jokes you tell them. Are there subject areas that you think are simply never appropriate places for humor? Uh, well, that's a good topic. We talked about in the class we taught. I, I co-taught this with two other faculty members, and we had some good discussions about that. And we tried to st steer students away from just a simple moralistic view that it's not the topic so much as it's how it's used. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes jokes about sexuality are bad not because they mention sexuality but because of the way they treat it. Um, they make it dirty, it, it's not dirty already. And so it's, it's more the context of the joke and the meaning of it uh, that's important rather than just the topic. Uh, so humor becomes pretty complicated now. You have a responsibility to your audience, and you have a responsibility to your subject, and you have to think about where you're coming from, and it's, uh -huh. it's uh, tricky. <laughs> That's right. So I'm glad I'm not a stand-up comedian. What would you suggest as options when, when I hear a joke that offends me or disappoints me? How should I respond to that without just ruining the whole mood or spoiling the community that's supposed to be developing? I, I think you could probably just say that. I think it's best to just... Mm -hmm. uh, spell it out. It's always deflating to the joke teller. Yes. Um, but then again, it's important to know what's mm -hmm. appropriate and what's not. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the kind of feedback we all need, I guess. And um, I mean, occasionally the person's standards are perhaps a bit too narrow, um, or they're they're too easily offended. But at the same time, um, they really need to express that. I think, and, and the the teller of the joke needs to respect that. Sure. Yeah, I, I guess if, if I tell a joke that you don't find funny, I assume that's your problem. Mm -hmm. But if you tell a joke that I don't find funny, I think that's probably your problem. <laughs> that's right, both ways. <laughs> yeah. that's right. Um, comedians uh, help us laugh at ourselves, maybe get unstuck. Are there, are there broad ways, either in terms of the way the brain functions or just, just socially, that humor uh, maybe could be just the right thing in a difficult situation? Well, it diffuses tensions, obviously, and again, it, um, just like animals use humor to signal that things are safe, it's a way to talk about maybe difficult subjects in safe ways. 
And so it can really do a lot of diffusing of tension or uh, concern. So in a marriage, uh, there's a lot of marriage counselors that suggest that uh, marriages that use a lot of humor actually do well. Because they diffuse a lot of tensions, mm. they diffuse a lot of problems. Uh, I used it on my wife a few times. She was complaining that I didn't put the little twisty ties on um, bread wrappers. Uh, so one morning after she left for work, I took all the bread wrappers, all the plastic bags I could find anywhere, and I put about 50 different uh, twisty ties on all of them. And she thought it was hilarious. Good. Uh, so you won so that one. She got the joke, and, yeah. and uh, so that little bit of humor between us um, that went a long ways to dealing with it. If I had just complained about her nagging me about this, that wouldn't have gone very far. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's more important to be able to laugh at yourself or to be able to laugh at a situation? Of course, it's always harder to laugh at yourself, I think, but I think it is important. I mean, I think if you can laugh at yourself, you realize your own absurdities and it humbles you just enough. That's, that's a good thing. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Karen. My guest today has been Paul Mose of the Calvin College Psychology Department, who studies how humor affects the brain. I'm Karen Salpi. Thank you for watching Inner Compass.